uh, they came up with this little brick walkway and rock walls and the sign. And I think it makes just a nice a nice connection between the public and the, this building here. And the reason why I brought that up is, you know, mostly people are walking down the street here and if they're on foot and accessing this, they're probably going to be coming around this parking and around all this stuff. And I, I think that there, this is the general area where you need a connection to the sidewalk that gets you into the site. And I just put together a few other examples. I mean, the police station's probably a little over the top, but creates a nice little space between the sidewalk and the building. Um, you know, even this has a connection between the sidewalk and the steps. Sea salt, which someone mentioned before, there's your entry, there's just a little bit of sidewalk going to the door, bench, light posts, and Rudy's as well, uh, which is now bird dogs, is your nice little entry porch connected to the stairs and you you know your project has longer to go from the sidewalk to the building but I think it needs some kind of connection that makes this a real transition and makes it inviting to get from the sidewalk to the front entry Okay, you can take back my hosting. You have to give it back to me. Oh, okay. Uh, you just go see. to my name and select make me host under participants. Joe, well, you're doing that. I just would comment that, yeah, I think this is also consistent with what we did with the Keep chiropractor um, down the road that we asked them to put in a walkway um, when their building wasn't even basically touching Ocean House Road, but it was for that very reason. I don't think it has to be very complicated or elaborate, but I think it needs something. Can I ask a question, Joe? Yes, absolutely. So, if Planting wise, um, I certainly understand the, you know, the desire to do no disturbance in the the old um, uh, tank area. But it looks like the tank area stops at what is basically the maybe the setback. It's really hard to know. Actually, I didn't know if there was there was if there was a designated area that had sort of been flagged that outside of that some additional plantings like shrubs or your walkway setup could be put um, to provide some additional buffering that wouldn't encroach on that area of kind of sort of higher risk. So it's hard to see from the plan though what that would be or if that would be. I'm sorry, you're talking about plantings where specifically? Yeah. Um, so behind the uh, behind the trees, so between the trees and the building or the parking lot, but outside the zone of disturbance that the tanks would have been. I, I don't know if the DEP sort of uh, demarcated an area that was the zone that you you should not touch. You know, I can see it kind of there. It says the old pump area or something, and it's it's stippled or something. Um, and but then you have this looks like the setback, like that dashed line. I don't know if, if, I mean, you're already planting outside the setback and or even outside of, um, I think, the property boundary. So the question is, could you put some additional shrubs or something, you know, between the trees and the parking area um, to provide a little more depth to the landscaping, but not in that zone of the old pump area where they're, you're worried about uh, digging into the the potentially contaminated soils. Um, I appreciate the suggestion. We're all for landscaping, but it, unfortunately it doesn't work that way. The VRAP program literally covers an entire property. 
Um, so even, and you're absolutely right, as far as the tanks are concerned, it's not likely that even if there had been a ruptured tank that you're going to find uh, contaminants in the soil all over the site just because of one ruptured tank, but you don't know that. And what the EAP did with the um, Environmental Action Plan did was to stipulate that uh, what we already know, that the tanks were removed in the area that you can actually see in the grayscale over here. But then the, uh, the VRAP program does, any VRAP program for any site does cover the entirety of a project. So that if we had to go to, if we we're going to be planting something anywhere on this site, even way off to the north where it's still wooded, it's still under that VRAP. And the DEP basically says, don't go there. If you can, can cap, based on what was there before, if you can encapsulate everything, the soils that are there right now, you need to do that. We're not supposed to be removing, we're, we can remove surface things, but we're not supposed to be doing any excavation. Um, and that's just a, the DEP requirement. Uh, as far as the landscaping is concerned, we're again, we're happy to uh, make it a nice grassed buffer. Um, and even, you know, little low gardens, pachysandra or something of that effect, which would be fine. But as far as anything that needs a deeper excavation for planting, we just can't do that. Well, can you add soil on top of them? I mean, it's not necessarily, I'm not suggesting this should be done or has to be done. I don't know even how it would look, but I've certainly seen people instead of excavating, especially in areas where literally it, it, there's blasted stone, which I see a lot in my neighborhood, you know, people just basically add up, you know, they're not doing any excavation. They're basically putting, especially you can get away with the shrubs and probably not trees, but you're essentially adding on to you instead of doing any excavation and you're basically planting on top of the, the existing. Uh, that is something as far as the DEPs, I mean, I won't speak for them, but typically that is allowed. As long as we're not excavating, as long as we're not digging into the soil, any, adding anything on the top of it is uh, potentially allowed as far as the DEP is concerned. Not that it would not be in contravention of the VRAP. Okay, so anything just, with that as, is, as an option anyway. So Yeah, and, and we could spruce something up toward the end of the, uh, you know, do a little uh, a landscape mound or something like that toward the back end of the parking area just to kind of give it a little continuity with the, uh, and when you're seeing over the top of that to the woods that are along Ocean House Road, et cetera, um, that's fine. And that's pretty simple to do. Thanks. Maureen? Yes. Were you going to say something? No, I was not. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, you're keeping the existing, uh, wait, hold on. All right, have we exhausted that topic? Does anybody have anything else to say on that? Nope. Okay, moving on. Parking lot. Um, I guess one question is the wings. How many people want to get rid of them? Well, they only want to get rid of one of them. Correct? I am. Looks That's like correct. you're getting rid of two. No, the one where, you, where the arrow is right now, that's staying there. That, oh, there's a small Which one point is there pointing with the green. Um, the uh, there's a small portion of that wing ring right where the arrow is right now that uh, we'll be cutting back, but you can see that the wing is still staying there. Uh, the proposal is to get rid of the wing on the other side, uh, primarily from a maintenance standpoint, ease of traffic flow and plowing more than anything else. Yeah, no, I understand that. Um, and are you are you going to add curb or something there to the sidewalk? It's just a very like. There's, tiny a, there's already a curb there. Okay. I don't have an issue with oh, the of that wing. Uh, yeah, I don't really have an issue with removing the far wing. Oh, yeah. Anybody else? Up? If it was a highly decorative, like, you know, it had plantings in it or something, I would say keep it. But if it's just a big block of concrete, I don't see, I don't see any negative there. 
There are, I, sh I should mention that in, on that northerly wing, meaning the one that's farthest away from Scott Dyer, um, there is a little portion of landscaping now that's in there. It hasn't been doing much for the past six years. Nobody's really taken care of it. So it's pretty overgrown and stuff. Um, that would be removed. That portion of that would be removed. Okay. All right, uh, buffering. Um, so the, the buffering along the back is existing and uh, it's, you have buffering on your, you have vegetation on your side of the property line. Yes, uh, along the back side where it, where it abuts the abutter, the red barn and then the, the new structure down below, yes. Um, there's a fair amount of uh, vegetation, uh, high trees, not really old growth, but uh, fairly substantial trees and some bushes along that end. Um, and then there's a, a small fence that's open there as well. Okay. And the uh, northern triangle there, that's not really any kind of issue? No, we're, we're not going there at all. That's all uh, exposed ledge and rock, or I mean, and, uh, and woods natural vegetation. We don't need to, we're not planting anything there. All right, and you're adding the three trees, yep. five trees rather. Okay, anybody have any comments on buffering? Speak now. No. Well, I think I made my basically my buffering comment on our landscaping. So they've already heard my take on that. Okay, so um, let's then move on to uh, other issues. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, Carol Ann. Are we going to do a sidewalk? Well, I was just thinking that. That telepathy. You, you read my mind over the internet. Um, what is, how does it, what do people think of doing a sidewalk? Given that we're doing it, it would be under our new regimen where it's, uh, what do we decide? It's just me and Maureen? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would like to go. Uh, can, you re re can you remind me? Certainly. So the idea would be that we'd want to keep the attendees to 10 or fewer. So okay. it would be the seven planning board members, it would be two representatives all allocated to the applicant and the planner who would also be responsible for videotaping the site walk so that that could be posted on the website and the public would have access to the website versus the video via the video uh, board members would have to stay six feet apart everyone would have to stay six feet apart and wear a mask i just would point out if uh, i believe if we wait till june 1st then mm -hmm. the person requirement is lifted it's going up to 50, I think. Yes, it is. Uh, I would, I think a site walk would be a good idea. All right, can we just go down everybody yay or nay it? Uh, let's see. I'll just call on people. Carol Ann. Sure, whatever. <laughs> Jim. Yes. Jonathan. Yes. Peter. Yes. Andrew. Yes. Daniel. Yes. And Joe is the yes. Okay, so we're going to have one. Um, Maureen. Yes. <laughs> we need a schedule. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. So do you want to wait? The thing is, if you can try to get it done in the next two weeks, then whatever gets discussed at the workshop at the site visit will help the applicant uh, yeah. guidance. If you wait till June 1st, the, the submission deadline for the June meeting has passed. And so um, it's less uh, probably useful. Yeah, I'd say given the amount of time that's, that has elapsed on this, we should do it soon. So it can What's be helpful. Memorial Day. <laughs> what day? I think Caroline's going to a concert and then to a bar. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I gotta look at my calendar. Is there preference for end of day, during the day, or end of day? End of day. End yeah, of day. end of day. End yes. Of day, weekday. End of day would be five o'clock. Okay. That's good. It's late, late now. How about the 22nd? What day of the week is that? Friday. Right. Oh. I can't do that day. <laughs> yeah, not, not Friday. Mm -hmm. How about Thursday, the 21st? Oh. I can't do this week at all. Tuesday, the 26th? Sure. Yep. Yep. For me. That gonna work Jim, how's that work for you? I can't be there till. Not you, Jim. Jim Fisher. Yes. Oh. Do that. Jim Huebner. I can't be there till six, but if I'm the only one, then go ahead without me. I'll just get there. I'll try and get there late. Or we should start it's, at six. Yeah, it's, it's still late. late at six. Yeah. Six works okay. for me. It makes the. the a lot easier for me. I didn't, so, yeah. And Alyssa, does that work for you? Alyssa, are you still there? Or I'm mute. You? <laughs> Was that the 23rd at, at 6? 26, Tuesday at 6. Tuesday the 26th. Tuesday 26th. That worked for me. All right, and so we're limited to 10, so they can only have two people. Correct. So, Mike, if you want to go, then. I'm okay not being there. Yeah, okay. Yeah, if you got to listen, Jim, there, you're in good hands. I think so. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so Tuesday. Six, 26. I'm sorry, that was Tuesday the 26th at what time? Six. Six o'clock, okay. I don't, I don't know who's bringing the beer, but. <laughs> you got, you heard me, Jim, huh? <laughs> okay, I've opened up, um, the staff planning report here. Uh, is there anything that anybody wants to discuss from it? Um, what? The staff planning report. You know, yeah. the hey, Joe, sorry. Sure. Yeah, uh, Joe, this, this is Dan. Um, just a comment about the noise um, levels from the dust collector and um, I think in an email about, um, I guess in the report, the noise level was for the forklift and not the dust collector. Yeah. Can we ask the applicant to talk about the dust collector? Um, I understand the purpose of it. Jim went through that, I get all that. Um, but the ordinance, Maureen, can you go through the ordinance again on the sound level at the um, property line? Please. Sure. And, and my concern is that the applicant has provided us a noise study and the noise study is based on the power tools and they use the loudest power tool and that power tool meets the standard and all by itself. So that's where layering on additional pieces of equipment starts to become um, potentially concerning for the planning board. So I'm going to uh, the site plan standards 
under uh, page 276 in the zoning ordinance. And the noise levels are regulated based on um, the zoning and the use. So this property is in a commercial district and in a commercial district from, um, from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. you're allowed 65 decibels at the property line and then from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. you're allowed 55 decibels at the property line. And because the applicant said that they were holding, they were, they were using the equipment only during the DIY classes and the DIY classes were between six and 9 p.m. at night, it seemed like the only standard we had to really be concerned about was the 65 decibels, not the 55 decibels. And uh, in the memo, we have, um, you know, if you, I, I just, I'm not a noise engineer, but if you're using more than one power tool at the same time, or if using a power tool in the dust collector at the same time, um, it seems like I'm not sure you wouldn't exceed the 65 decibels. So I was trying to build on the information the applicant has already provided, um, but the only thing we provided was one piece of equipment being operated inside the building. Yeah, so, my, so uh, just a follow up on that. Um, I, I think you can get dust collectors with noise abatement on the discharge side of the dust collector, I believe. Um, has the applicant looked at that? And where is the dust collector on the floor plan? I didn't see it. Um, the dust collector will be mounted to the front, the Ocean House side of the building, and it doesn't have, um, it doesn't vent to the outside. It's um, I sent the specs to Jim. I don't know if Jim included them in the application. Wait, it mounts on the exterior or interior? Interior. 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 Okay. okay. Um, but, it um, but it doesn't create a vacuum when the dust goes in. It has air ports, like filter ports above it, so that it allows air to go out as air comes in. Yeah, right. And it has ducts connecting from the dust collector to the power tools. So. What you want to do is you want to turn the um, dust collector on and then run your table saw so that all the wood dust from the table saw goes right into the dust collector. Yeah. So, so there's no um, discharge to the exterior, it's self-contained within the yes. building? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. So the decibels level for the equipment that you provided, that that's just for the equipment freestanding in a room. That's not looking at the sound crossing a wall with insulation in it or a roof with insulation, correct? That is correct. That's like taking a skill saw and firing it up in the parking lot. So, I mean, I, you're, not, you're not operating tools outside the building. All operation of the tools is inside the building, correct? Yes. So, What's the STC on the walls? I mean, that would be a good thing to start with, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you, do you put spray foam in the ceiling? Yes, there is. So, I mean, if the, if I, if, if the decibel level is like 65 at any, across the wall, that would be very surprising. I, I've run the dust collector and the table saw, and they're they're not much louder than a vacuum. Um, well, whether they are or not, the, it's not the the sound level is for the exterior, not the interior of the building. So, Jim, base. I've done plenty of dust collection systems. Everything's inside. Um, the fan will whine but that's inside my experience, you will hardly even hear it running when you're outside. Correct, that's correct. I mean, the problem is if you have open doors or windows, that's where all your sound's gonna leak in. Even still, I mean, you may- well, Not from the, the dust collection, but just from the power tools. But these are these are sealed, predominantly sealed windows, and it's an air conditioned building for the few months we need air conditioning. Um, so there's no open uh, doors or, or 
or windows on the building. Um, so I'm not, I mean, I know that, I know that a wall with a high SCC is going to cut down sound transmission, but I'm not an acoustical engineer. So it seems like you want to give us some, something that's going to show what the sound level is going to be at the property line. And I guess, Maureen, in the past, we've, we've given people the option of measuring sound at the property line and then mitigating it if, if the sound level is too high. Yes, and which made me wonder, there's a section of fence at the rear of the building. I didn't know what the purpose of that fence was. and Maybe it was intended to be mitigation, but I don't know. Uh, that's a part of it. It's right toward that back end. Uh, uh, what Maureen's referring to is at the northwesterly side. Uh, there's a small section of, of the building. There's a small section of fence over in that area that's designed to be able to augment the screening and then uh, potentially from a noise perspective as well. Because that's where that's the end of the building where the, uh, the raised platform is going to be for the classes. So that would be the closest portion of this building to the mixed use on the other side of that boundary line. All right. Um, hey, Joe, yeah. say something. Yes. Um, I just think that when we had the cell towers, um, that were that had the generators that were going to operate that had the other cooling systems going on we basically said to them we want to know in the worst case scenario when everything is running how much sound is going to be at the property line um, because there are residences close to where these cell towers were and you're going to be abutting a, a residence um, right next door so I, I do want to see the same thing that joe was mentioning about just making sure that that's in the application, that when the skill saw is going, when the dust collector is going, that there's not going to be a sound issue at the uh, property line. Joe? Yes, Maureen. Uh, the noise study was studied, was, excuse me, was submitted in last month's package, and I have pulled it up because um, I wanted to make sure what I heard and what I remembered was correct, and I'm happy to share it on the screen. But the study that was submitted, um, the, the sound engineer was giving us a sound level at the property line. So based on this study, they were, they were considering that the, the, the doors and the windows were closed and there's a wall and they have an estimated sound of 55.4 decibels at the property line from the loudest equipment in the workshop, hmm. which was why I thought we, I thought there might be some concern if you had multiple pieces of equipment running at the same time, because you've gone, you've got less than 10 more decibels before you start violating that 65 decibel. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm very happy to limit it to two, to just a tool with the dust collector. I mean, I'm happy to cap it at two. Joe? Good morning. We still don't know if the two together will be more than 65 decibels at the property line. Uh, Joe, one the, other technical question too, is the sound data we have on the machine running, is that under load or is that just running free? Because I think a lot of the power saw equipment under load actually becomes noisier than just, you know, running without any, any load on it. Let's go back to the study. Well. Uh, sorry, Joe. Well, uh, um, yeah, I think someone mentioned it earlier. Noise is quite a hard thing to calculate because there are so many variables, but there could be something we could do to the interior um, because three walls are CMU, it's a pretty solid wall for noise transmission. Um, we could add soundboard to the interior. 
which kind of has a little layer of plastic between the jib, which also helps kind of mask noise. And we do that on healthcare projects and other places where noise is much more um, measured. And if this is kind of to concern about noise at the property line, I think that would also bring and contain the noise within the four walls. Well, I think whoever is doing the acoustical modeling should take that, you know, can take that into account. I mean, they should be able to produce a model and say, it's producing this much sound and then if you need to reduce that you can start adding layers of stuff i mean we don't we have no way of knowing okay would, we be, would we be satisfied with then um doing the test with just two pieces running like mike was mentioning earlier yeah all right well i i would like to see like i said sort of that worst case scenario because maybe operating three, there's no problem. Uh, maybe operating two, there is a problem. And so then there's only one, how's that gonna work? So I, I think that if somebody's doing a, a sound study that's gonna be complete, we need to take in, into account as many variables as we can. What we don't wanna have happen is uh, this, the lumber gets started going, they start doing these classes and the neighbors are hearing saws. Or, or the saws are too loud at the property level, or property line. Yeah, I think what Jonathan said, I echo that. Yeah, and uh, also make sure that dust collector is running too uh, during that analysis. I mean, it could be, it could be three tools, Jonathan. It could be four tools and a dust collector, but there's got to be, a, you know, a reasonable worst case. And I think the sound consultant can quickly analyze that, taking into account the architects, putting up some sound deadening materials in the building. All right, so uh, can we move on from the sound issues? Anybody else wanna? What Dan said. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think the last item, as far as I can tell, is lighting. Um, can you bring up the lighting plan, Maureen, so we can really look at that? I think it is in the, uh, it's in the other set. Are actually the photometrics in the right? Okay. Binder. Hang on. It's okay. Right. One moment, please. All right. So if I could speak for a moment. Yes. 
because what I put in my memo was not complete. Um, you've got a pole light here on the uh, southwest corner. You've got a pole light here um, at the southeast corner. You have a pole light here at the northern corner. All three of those pole lights exceed 0.5 foot candles at the property line. Are those existing yes. locations? They're existing locations, yes. And I believe- So that moving them would require digging, right? Yes, we're prepared to do, we don't need them. We're prepared to just shut them off. No, but I mean, if you were to, I think what Maureen was getting at is if you move them around to reduce the light level, then you have to dig to I, run actually, power to them. I, I'm not even sure you have to move them if you wanted to keep them. I think what you have to do is just be a little bit more sophisticated with the fixture and add shielding into the fixture so the light is pushed into the site and not away from the site. Um, we could do that, or I spoke with Michael about that earlier, and uh, the only light that we'd really like to have for a security aspect is that which is over uh, by the uh, lumber storage area. Other than that, we really don't need the lights, particularly the one that was at the back, is at the corner, the inter near the intersection corner. That's now going to be in the middle of landscaping and woods. There's no reason to keep that there. It serves no purpose. The others that are next to the entrances, we don't really need them from a security standpoint or a safety standpoint because there are... Um, off-site lighting there are Cobra lights and then the lights that are right um, uh, right in the Esplanade uh, adjacent to the library parking lot which is literally right across the street from our Scott Dyer entrance so there's really no reason to have any of those lights there we can just we'll just remove them I'm good with that so the one over by the storage area is I, I keep wanting to point to my screen, but nobody can see me when I do that. <laughs> yeah, that one. That's the only one you really want to keep. Yes. For security purposes at the storage site. That's correct. What about how are you lighting the parking spaces? Uh, there are uh, uh, there are lights on the actual building itself. And then there's the, the light that's over near the lumber storage area that will take care of that portion of the parking lot. And then the rest of it has got the residual effects of the Cobra lights and the- Did you have, do you have a cut sheet of the light on the buildings in the packet? Yes. Uh, no, it's not in your packet. Well, I thought you did have some light fixtures in there. I think, um, hold on, let me just see if there is a, there are some light fixtures there. They were going on the, uh, the actual poles, but uh, hold on a minute. Okay, let's see him. Isn't that it? Oh, the Hubble Geopack. Oh, right on the light, actually on the lighting plan. Yes, um, those are the examples that uh, um, the lighting company used for to be able to take a look at these. But we, those aren't, uh, that's not really a wall pack for the, uh, um, for the house. There's the, the Hubble Geopack is the lower one that can actually go on the building. Um, and that's absolutely fine to be able to use. That's right up against the building itself. So there's no issues. As far, and that's hooded, as you can see. So that's not an issue. In terms of any uh, wall packs that Alyssa might end up being putting, uh, putting on for in conjunction with fenestration next to the, wall, to, the, uh, to the doors or the windows, we don't have any of that information. But otherwise, you're right, the, the Hubble Geopack would do it. Joe? Yeah. Yeah, Maureen. I just want to remind the board that you've had problems with a prior site plan when lighting that was installed on the building was not shown on the site plan. <laughs> yes. No, that's not a problem. I think, yeah, I mean, that, I think he's, Jim's talking about more like decorative sconces, but they should be that's used correct. in the final calculation. So what's lighting, the, the wall packs are, are lighting the uh, parking area, is lighting the parking area on the uh, 
east side of the drive? Uh, yes, uh, up against the building. Uh, the no, not again. The one not against the building. Isn't that east? North. No the, no, the single pole that would be, are you talking, Joe, about the pole that we want to keep there? No. You go back to the eastern parking spots. Yes, those, what's lighting that area? There's a single pole over there, just like the other poles. Where, 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 I'm not seeing it. Joe? Yes. So to be clear, if this, I think your question is, if this pole light isn't there, there's no lighting here. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly my question. Because this pole, that, that S4 light is kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Yes. Right? And so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be there, but you, that, you need some light on your parking area. Well, keep in mind that that pole is about twice as far removed from the parking area as the um, wall packs that would be on the building. Right. So we really don't, I mean, the parking that's off, or, I mean, excuse me, the lighting that's off in the middle of nowhere really isn't going to do much. It just kind of adds lighting pollution. No, I'm not worried about that. I'm, I mean, is where you have 0 0.01 foot candles on the ground in the parking spots. That's mostly from the wall packs. That doesn't seem like much light for a person parking in the evening in the winter. Does it? Um, I, I, I think we can make the wall packs, given the amount of area that we've got between the front facade of the building and the actual property line. Um, I think we've got plenty of room to be able to put a wall pack there that would be light enough without causing it for safety without causing additional light pollution. All right, just to reiterate, we can't put any new locations in because that would involve excavating for the poles, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, Joe? Yeah. Uh, on page six of Maureen's memo, there was some discussion about the fixtures on top of the pole being changed to be compatible with the town center. Fixes, yes. uh, is that still, is that item still uh, in play? Uh, no, because we're going to remove those poles. What about the wall packs? What about them? Could you pick something that's a little bit more consistent with the town center? Sure. That, that's, we have no issues as far as that's concerned. We just don't need all the extra lighting that's on site. So um, we can certainly, uh, I, listen, we can get together and we can certainly come up with wall packs that would be certainly safety or, or rated well enough for safety as far as it's a diffusion of light, but it's not going to be obnoxious and you're nowhere near going to see it uh, at a high foot candle level at the, at the property line. Joe? Yes, Maureen. So I have a question. Is, so this is, a, this is a significant change and the site standards say that you both are not supposed to exceed 0 0.5 foot candles at the property line, but also that there's supposed to be adequate lighting on the site for safety. Right. Is the board expecting this lighting plan to be updated to reflect what is actually now proposed? Absolutely. Yes. Sure, that's not a problem. We'll, we'll just show that the, the elimination of those three poles that we don't need and then keeping the one that uh, we do want over by the lumber storage area. And then we'll also show the wall packs with the, uh, uh, the foot candle lightings around those. So you have power running to those locations. What else could you put there? What else, what else could we put on the light poles? I'm just thinking it'd be nice to, since you can't really dig into the site and you have those power locations, it'd be nice to uh, save them for future use of some sort. Well, we don't have to get rid of the actual uh, conduit. We can leave that there, but we right. can just turn it off and get rid of the poles. In fact, that's that, that's an absolute. We really do have to leave it there because that conduit runs beneath the pavement and we're not allowed to go there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, Maureen. So just to be clear, um, Jim, when you resubmit the plans, there needs to be clear notes on the site plan that says these are going to be removed and what are you going to leave? I mean, is there just going to be a, a concrete mold or whatever you're going to do? It needs yep. to be on the plan. Okay. All right. Um, I think that covers everything. Maureen, is there anything? Anything else you think we need to cover? The pedestrian lighting adjacent to the Ocean House Road sidewalk? Ah, uh, yes. Um, Or, so you don't want to put in the pedestrian lighting, I take it. Uh, that kind of cuts to the chase, yes. Uh, on a project of this size and this magnitude, um, putting in pedestrian lighting in the right of way that doesn't really have anything to do with this project, it's actually just going to, it's underneath the Cobra lighting. So from a lighting perspective, it does nothing. Uh, well, but actually, I understand that. I mean, I think if you look, go through the town center, you'll find that the pedestrian lighting they're actually on that corner across the street from this there's a uh, town uh, a street light maybe eight feet from a uh, cobra light and you know the street lights the street lights give the whole sidewalk a rhythm and continuity and they're part of the village feeling so the fact that the cobra lights there is to me is immaterial um yeah, I, I can appreciate that as far as the aesthetic is concerned but i'd like to also just call attention to the perspective for the uh, um, perspective of this actual uh site it, it, it's compared to a lot of the others if the town wants to put in lighting there that's absolutely fine it's not on our property we can't do anything with it anyway but it would probably look fine but uh, to put that burden of responsibility, because we've got a long facade, as somebody had mentioned before, this is a very uniquely shaped site. And uh, the longest facade basically is that, which is along Ocean House Road and then coming up towards Scott Dyer. And uh, to be able to put the burden, the financial burden, and those lights are expensive, um, on a very small business owner who's trying to make the most of an existing site is huge. Um, that expense is a, significant portion of the entire budget that would be allocated to this whole project. And just to put that on one small business owner, when it's an aesthetic purpose only, it serves no safety or security reasons, it'd be great to have it there. But if the town's going to do it on the other side of the town's dollar, the town can do it on this side as well. We certainly have no objection toward that. I just want to add on what Jim said, and I appreciate it. Um, I, I have a limited budget, and I don't have endless dollars. And um, I've got budget lines that are changing daily. And the added expense of putting in town lighting, um, it, it's, it, it, it's I, I mean, I can't put it to words how difficult that would be for me. Can I just make a point? Yep. And I'm going to make this for current and future applicants, not to be sort of nasty about it, but the fact of the matter is the standards were in place before the property was purchased. So, um, you know, all those things need to be taken into account when you actually do the calculations to, to buy something. I'm not necessarily saying that the applicant should necessarily do this, but I just want to make it clear that I don't feel like, you know, you can, somebody can use the excuse that you're in a limited budget when a standard has to be met when something's being developed. So that's just the way it is. Um, I, I still think we have to keep it in perspective as far as the size of any given project. I mean, even if there were deep pockets on this, this is a very small parcel 
with a, a huge line that happens to be in the area where the town would, or where the, the Marine or whomever is looking to be able to put those lights. And, you know, we're not talking, you know, one light. If we were that, that's not an issue. We're talking probably a half a dozen lights and along that whole facade. And that, that doesn't, yes, it looks nice when people are driving up Ocean House Road, but other than that, it has nothing to do with this parcel. And it's all well and good to be able to say, yes, certain things are in the regulation, but when we're trying to redo a parcel, unlike the previous three applicants that we had um, for this, that we were involved with at this particular site, all of whom ended up walking away just because of the, the costs of the improvements uh, that were being required. This is just, it's a burden on a very small businessman and a very small business site that really can't get any bigger than this. So even any future use beyond the lumbery isn't really gonna change this site very much. And that's just a, an incredible expense. Uh, to be able to put at, as a one-time effort on one individual. It, if the town wants to put it there, that's great. But at the expense of an individual, when, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, the other lights that have been in town were are in the public right-of-way were paid for by the public. Um, Maureen, so. uh, Jim, let me let Maureen address that because I was, that's my next question to her. Because I know I'm looking at a picture of Seesaw with two lights in front. And uh, I'm wondering who's paid for what in previous? Uh... Paid for by the applicant. There, there was a section of sidewalk built on uh, Scott Dyer Road on the southern side from Longfellow Drive all the way to the town center and then down Ocean House Road on one side, stopping at Jordan Way. So that was built with a grant that the town installed. So we got 80% of it paid for with grant money. The ordinance explicitly says that individual property owners are, are responsible for installing the sidewalk. This was discussed by a council and previously it was reviewed, it's been a requirement. I, I just wanna make sure it's clear that the, the idea that this is too much for one small business owner to have to do, this is what we require every business owner to do. Um, it explicitly says a sidewalk and other pedestrian pathways such as to the building and to parking areas shall be located between the road and the structure. So um, the, Girl Scout, uh, the Girl Scout house that Carol Ann mentioned on Shore Road, they were required to put in a sidewalk. Um, the 1226 property, they had to put in a sidewalk. The Selt property had to put in a sidewalk. Selt had to put in, uh, excuse me, Sea Salt put in a sidewalk and pedestrian lighting. Um, the town, when it redeveloped the community center, had to put in a sidewalk and pedestrian lighting. So this, these are requirements that have been required of every property owner in the town center. So every property owner in the town, the sidewalk's not the issue, there's already a sidewalk there, but all the lighting that's being requested so Every bit of lighting in the rest of the town has been paid for by individuals. The taxpayer was not involved. The sidewalk section is a sidewalk separated from the road by an esplanade, and the esplanade includes street trees and pedestrian lighting. And so this applicant is not being asked to do the same amount as other property owners have been required to do. They're being asked to only install the lighting portion and only on one frontage of their property. And I, I, I understand this is not um, a welcome requirement. I know that every property owner has to gulp a little bit. I was wondering if you have a cost estimate for installing just the pedestrian lighting along that Ocean House Road. Do we, do we have an idea of how many lights we're talking? I, I don't have that either. It's, I would. It would be useful if the applicant could maybe develop a little bit more of this. Um, um, I, I guess I come back to the fact that I'm, I'm a small business owner trying to start a small business. And, and I understand what uh, one of the board members said that I should know everything ahead of me. But when I'm creating my budget and I'm looking at the site plan application, um, the, the numbers add up so much. I mean, I'm already at $80,000 between architects, engineers, lawyers, designers, sound study, traffic study. Uh, if I add these lights, I'm literally going to be at, like, and I got to remove one third of my parking lot. I'm going to be at $150,000 and I haven't even started to fix up the building. Um, it, 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 it gets to a point where it becomes so expensive 
that that I'm basically shooting myself in the foot and I, and I don't know how, I mean, I'm so stressed out during this time and to open a business already 10 steps behind is, I, I don't know if anyone of you guys have opened a business, but it is not easy. And, and to have a private property player owner pay for public lighting on top of starting a business, just, it doesn't make sense to me. And I understand it's been done before and it's in the ordinance and I didn't read that when I, <laughs> the property uh, that I have to pay for town lighting um, but it, I'm just trying to start a business and it's not easy sorry I, I appreciate everyone being here I appreciate everyone's suggestions and I'm trying to work with the design standards um, I, I want to work with everyone but I, I really hope there's a compromise that I could actually afford to open my business Well, I think one thing that Maureen was starting to suggest is that, uh, Jim, you take a look and see like what the minimum number of lights you could install is, you know, given that you're just requiring it on one side. And, um, you know, maybe there's a solution where you just do something with the uh, entry into the site with the lighting. Do new underground wiring from my building to the sidewalk? And I mean, this is the reason I keep mentioning that the town is moving ahead with a project across the street. There's probably an opportunity to piggyback on to the lighting design that's already happening across the street so that you wouldn't have to have any of the the cabling on your property at all it would all it could be connected up into the system that the town is designing right now so i'm paying for the electrician and for the lights and the standard is a sidewalk, esplanade, street trees, and lighting. I don't think the planning board has the authority to waive that. Um, so the planning board does have, they, they can uh, apply exemptions for existing conditions. That, that's in the site plan. Yeah, but that's not an existing condition. The whole, the whole property is an existing condition. Maybe we can, Joe, maybe we can get some, uh, some information for the board uh, when we meet at the site walk. Um, so we can literally take a practical look at not just this issue, but uh, I mean, the entire thing that we'll be looking at. And just, uh, you know, seeing as your suggestion was, you know, maybe we don't have to do the entire thing. Um, it would be great not to have to do anything, uh, given that it's in the public right of way. But if there's a compromise to be had, rather than popping in a half a dozen lights going up the, or, or however many are required otherwise, I'm um, going all the way up that long facade. Um, but we could certainly take a look at that when we're out there for the hour that it would run for the site walk. I would be amenable to that. I think that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Any other items? Nope. Okay. Want a motion? I would love a motion. Motion motion to table, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Michael Friedland doing business as Yam Yam LLC for site plan review to operate a 1,324 square foot village retail lumber store, 400 square foot uh, do-it-yourself classes, 256 square feet of office in the existing 1,980 square foot 
building located at 287 Ocean House Road be tabled to the regular June 16, 2020 meeting of the Planning Board? Do I have a second? Second. Great. Um, any discussion? All right, Maureen, can you please call a roll vote? Mr. Bedensky. Uh, yes. Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Starbeck. Yes. And Mr. Shalott. Yes. Motion is unanimous. Um, the item is tabled till the next meeting. Thank you, uh, Mike's crew. We will see you at the sidewalk. So we will all just park basically in the parking lot the way it is right now and just meet in front of the building basically at six o'clock. Yep. Thank Great. You. Okay. Thank you all for your time. All right. Thank you. All right. Just give me one second. Hmm. Thank you, Maureen. Okay, so other business. Uh, the planning board will review meeting logistics. How did everybody think this went? <laughs> pretty good. You mean the logistics? Yeah. Logistics, logistics. were fine. The logistics are fine, Joe. <laughs> Yes. All right. I'm sorry about the calling on people, but I start looking at stuff and it's hard for me to pay attention to the little hand waving thing. That's okay. Joe, do you have two screens? I do. I actually you know have you, three. You can drag the grid of people over another screen and expand I, it. I know. I've done that. I was at a Zoom meeting with like 50 people and I had one, all 50 on one screen. Wow. I don't know why, it seems problematic though. It doesn't, it seems to work differently at different points throughout the meeting for me, so. Um, all right, well, so no complaints. <laughs> I think we working through that. The way is everybody ready for the pandemic to be over? <laughs> yes, I need people to go back to work. <laughs> I need Jim to get out to get some shampoo. <laughs> so you probably don't want to hear this, but I, I was at a Zoom meeting with the town manager earlier today and um, just happened to be mentioning the planning board something was coming in and i said well i i how long are we going to be meeting in zoom and when is the and his prediction was we will at least be doing this through the summer oh. yeah i think that's <laughs> correct it's not surprising that's what everyone's doing way past the summer way past. Maureen, yes. Maureen, can i ask uh for the next workshop or the next planning board meeting do we have big agendas obviously 287 is going to be on there but um Anything else, any big projects? Nothing, nothing on the regular meeting. We do have uh, probably uh, phase two um, of the access ramp on the school campus property. We'll be on the workshop for June and um, they're hoping to build this summer. So that's kind of exciting. The, the first phase that you approved has already been constructed. Nice. Um, anything on that project over off of Shore Road near the Oakhurst neighborhood? Um, no, but that was, that's also Jim Fisher. So. Okay. No, I was just curious if, if cause that's going to be a big project if that keeps going. So. Yes. Be fun to do over Zoom. Is that some kind of project? Yeah. 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 All right. Is that it for meeting logistics review? Okay. Anybody wanted anybody around to make a public uh, 
<laughs> comment. No. We all drove, we drove them all away. All right. Uh, somebody motion like to, to make a motion, motion to adjourn. Motion Second. to adjourn. Second. <laughs> okay. Can you take a roll call, Maureen? Sure. Mr. Bedensky. Yes. I'm ready to adjourn. <laughs> Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Hubner. Yes. Mr. Gilbert. Yes. Ms. Jordan. Please, yes. <laughs> Mr. Sarlat. Yes. And Chair Charlotte. Yes. Not that oh, I don't like sorry. Seeing. Yes. Okay. The motion passes and it is unanimous. The meeting is hereby adjourned. Yay. See you. Have, have a good night. Good night. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. to leave it won't let me i know the feeling <laughs>